a gr- great day. I-, I want you to turn your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 17, Old Testament verse of 1 Samuel chapter 17. And, uh, and you know, we're going to jump back in, uh, really close out a series of messages I've done since Easter called Church Close. I know that's an odd title, but the reality is this. Um, I'm God who is this transcendent, so much further in, 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 in kind of wisdom and power than we can even grasp, chooses to reveal himself in very ordinary ways. And, um, and one of the ways that you'll find through Scripture that he does that is basically through clothing, that clothing represents things he does in our lives. So we've just been exploring those passages over the last few weeks. I want to end today by talking about how we live with labels, live with labels. Um, I don't know exactly when it happens, but at some point there's a time when things don't matter and then all of a sudden they do. Um, We have entered the point where for our oldest son, he didn't care what he wore before, but now labels matter in a great deal. He wants certain labels and emblems because in his world, cool or lame is separated by the label. And I guess that's kind of true for all of us. I remember when I was a kid, your jeans needed to be Guess, Tommy, or Gap. Your shoes needed to be Airwalks or Air Jordans. You needed to have that that Quicksilver t-shirt. And if you had all of that with a pair of Oakley sunglasses, listen, you were guaranteed to succeed in life. Um, The problem was I didn't have any of that. Um, My mom and dad went to school while they worked when I was a kid. And so um, though they're successful now, back then our resources were quite limited. So everybody else wore Ralph Lauren. I wore Ralph. That's all I got, you know. I remember one time looking over at another kid in our class, and he had a little alligator on his shirt. So I took out my little scissors, and I made a little alligator and put it on my shirt. Like, I wasn't Lacoste. I was La Paper Mate, you know. And, and, uh, but, but the reality is this. Back then, now, in your life, my life, labels still carry great weight. And, um, but as you age, here's what I've noticed. It's not the labels on your clothes. It's the labels on your soul that tend to matter more. Every person here, if we could see them spiritually, has beliefs, thoughts that are labeled on who they are. And like Velcro, they stick to us and begin to shape who we are. And honestly, many of you listening, the labels you're wearing are not labels that you would have chosen for yourself. Uh, I want to explore this idea in the life of a biblical figure named David. You probably have heard of David. He's famous for this battle that took place of David and Goliath. I want to talk to you, though, just before he goes into that battle. See, David was the youngest of eight sons, um, and his brothers were all in the royal army, and he was still at home with his parents. And one day his dad comes to him and says, I want you to take a, uh, some supplies to your brothers. This is the first occurrence of Uber Eats. He jumps on, uh, you know, whatever he rides on, goes and delivers these supplies to the army. But when he arrives, he notices the culture, the atmosphere of the place is a little tight. The Israeli royal army is, um, they're, they're bent with fear. Because for 40 days across the battlefield, a giant, a warrior named Goliath has stepped out and ch- insulted and challenged the Israeli armies. He's basically said, instead of our armies fighting with one another, why don't you send me your best warrior? And then he says, we'll, we'll have a, a, a battle, and wh- whichever warrior wins, the army then will become subject to the other army. Well, the problem is, is no one in the royal army wants to face Goliath. And so they're all huddled up in fear. But David, it's interesting, what worries the, the army awakens a warrior in David. And he steps up as a little boy and says, I want to face Goliath. Now, we think this is a valiant moment, and it was, but we often miss that before he goes to battle against Goliath, he first has to battle against some labels that immediately start to stick to his soul. For example, in verse 28, his oldest brother, Eliab, looks at him, and he doesn't celebrate David's bravery. Instead, he, sa- he begins to curse it. He says, you need to go back home with mom and dad. You're just a little boy. Go take care of the sheep, which was a job that didn't matter, and we'll stay out here and do the things that really matter. And then he takes it a step further and says, David, the real issue you've got going on is that you're just out here for fame and fortune. You've got the wrong motives. And what most people think would be just sibling rivalry to a little boy who looks up to his oldest brother, it becomes a label of rejection. 
And then, without even being able to get his bearings, he hears the bellowing voice of Goliath. Goliath sees that David is now the challenger, and here's what he says. Do you send me a little dog to fight against? He says, I'm a giant. This is a chihuahua. And he says to David, you can come out here, boy, but I will take your bones and feed them to the birds. He basically says, you can try all you want, but at the end of the day, you are doomed in this situation. There is nothing you're going to do, no effort you're going to make that's not going to end in your demise. And then the king notices David, and he walks up, and he, in verse 33, he says, this is, this is the one? Look how scrawny. Look how small. Look how inexperienced. He basically says, David, you don't have what it takes. You're lacking something. And, and, and it goes a step further because in verse 38, here's what the, the king chooses to do. He says, if none of us are brave enough to go, maybe we can dress David up. The Bible says, then Saul, who was the king, gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never wore such things before. And when he took a few steps, so it's this little boy in this man's armor. When he takes a few steps, now all of a sudden, David even labels himself, there's no way this is going to work. I'm a failure. I can't move in this. If you could have seen David that day on the battlefield, if you could have seen his soul, that's what he would have looked like. And the reality is for many of you, if we can see your soul, that's what it looks like. At some point, a parent or authority figure looked at you and said, you're not good enough. It doesn't matter what you do. And, and so you've lived with rejection your whole life, never feeling accepted even when you've accomplished things. For some of you, it was someone else who spoke doom over you. Doom is the idea that no matter how hard you try, you're not going to succeed, which is why for some of you, before new seasons have even begun in your life, new semesters and new jobs, you already think you're going to fail because you just think you're doomed. Then some of you are here and you, you just, you know, you don't have what it takes. Other people have told you that. You believe that. It's why you fade to the back. It's why you don't raise your hand. It's why you don't offer the ideas because you know, I don't have what it takes. And ultimately, we all struggle with a label of failure. That no matter what we do, it's not going to work out. We cannot be successful at what we set our minds to. You see, over the years, comment by comment, occurrence by occurrence, insult by insult, it weaves together like a straitjacket of self-doubt that causes you and I to be held back. Labels are nothing more than false beliefs that keep us from living the life God intended, and many people are being captured by those. Listen, I'll say it this way. For many of you, the most powerful guiding force in your life is not what God says, it's the labels that you listen to. And they're so powerful, they're literally directing you in directions you were never destined to go in. Um, you know, Kayla, years ago, was a dental hygienist. One day she was, she was cleaning the teeth of a lady named Trudy, Trudy's dad's name is Billy Hornsby. When Billy was in eighth grade, he was very bright, very intelligent. And one day, his math teacher put an, uh, an equation on the board and said, Billy, come to the board and solve this math equation. Billy got up from his desk, and he was so bright, he figured out the equation in his mind on the way there. So when he got to the board, he just wrote out the answer. Went and sat back down, but the teacher said, I'm sorry, that's wrong. Billy said, no, it's not wrong. It's the right answer. He goes, yeah, it's the right answer, but I wanted you to work out the math in front of everybody. Now, Billy, being young, he, he kind of pushed back. He said, why, why do I need to work out the math? I did it in my head. It's the right answer. It sent the teacher into just some frustration. And so the teacher had a moment where they lashed out and announced to the whole class, Hornsby, you're never going to amount to anything in life. That was just a moment. But to Billy, something in his soul turned off. He said the next day he came and resigned himself from learning. He began to sleep in class, and by 15, he was playing music in bars for money, and he was sleeping during the day in class. He dropped out of school by 17, had his first daughter by 18, had three daughters by 20, no job, no faith, and was exactly what the teacher said. One day, just out of desperation, Billy applies for a job at Exxon Mobil for an a, a entry-level position, just something to help pay the bills. Exxon Mobil's a massive conglomerate globally 
tens of thousands of employees. And so you have to take an entrance exam when you apply. It's not just an application, it's also an exam. As Billy was taking the exam, he could hear that teacher, Hornsby, you'll never amount to anything, over and over. So much that when he walked to the door uh, to exit, he handed the examiner his finished test and said, I know I failed, don't even bother calling me. The next day, ExxonMobil did call him, and the examiner said, Mr. Hornsby, we'd love to have you come in and talk about your test. He said, why are you going to make me waste gas coming in to talk about that I failed? I know I failed. Just go ahead and tell me over the phone. He said, sir, we really would like for you to come in. The next day, Billy goes and sits down with the the examiner from ExxonMobil, and they tell him, Mr. Hornsby, you have scored higher on this test than any person who's ever worked at ExxonMobil. And then he said this, he said, if you'll put your mind to it, you can do anything you want, including running this company. He said, whatever all those years ago that teacher turned off, all of a sudden got turned back on. He had a successful career, became a follower of Jesus. He was so successful that he retired early and gave the latter years of his life and his brilliance to helping run a church planning organization that has planted over a thousand churches in the United States, one of which our campus pastors are trained by. Our Jefferson County location is there because of Billy's brilliance and how to plant churches. Listen, here's what that means. Here's what that means. It was only possible, though, because there was a moment where the wrong label was taken off and the right label was put on. You see, David had the same moment. Scripture says he took off Saul's armor and he picked up a shepherd's cloak, a shepherd's staff, a sling, and five stones, and he went and took out Goliath. The rest was history. You know why? Because when you get your God-given identity right, victory comes natural. The right steps, the right, the right actions, the right attitudes, it just becomes easy once you know who you are in Christ. And, and, and you need a moment like Billy. You need a moment like David where the wrong labels are taken off and the right ones are put on so that you can begin to walk in all God's destined you to walk into. And so I, I want to help you with that today. I'm going to give you three steps I see in David's story that can help you take off the wrong labels and put on the right ones. I think they're going to be impactful. If you want to take notes, the first one is this. Um, you've got to start by tracing the label, tracing the label. Recently, I read that um, the average person has 60,000 thoughts a day, 60,000 thoughts a day. Now, that's impressive, but consider this. The same study found 80% of those thoughts are negative. 80% of 60,000 are negative, which means it's difficult to come and just pull a label off because, frankly, we're living in a fog of negativity. I mean, we see so many things wrong with us, so many things wrong with our situation. It's hard to just grab one label, which means, though, you're going to have to do some due diligence and trace the labels that are holding you back the most. You're going to have to do some investigation, like one-on-one -on -one figuring out, how did I start to believe that? And here's what you're going to discover as you investigate the labels that you're living with. You're going to discover that what appears to be your thought actually was someone else's voice. You see, for many of us, we say things like, I'm stupid. But if traced back, what you'll find is when you were growing up, somebody looked at you and said, you're not that bright, are you? Some of us say, I'm fat. But if traced back, what you may find is someone said, if you lost 10 pounds, you'd look a lot better. We say things like, I'm pathetic. But the truth is that was planted some time ago when we came to this conclusion that someone said, hey, you, you need to be more like your brother, your sister, a friend. The, the, their comparison started that. And, and years later, it sounds like us, but it's not really us. It's just us echoing someone else's voice. So let me ask you this. Who do your negative thoughts echo? I'm going to give you a clue. Psychologists tell us that our self-esteem is mostly framed by those we esteem the most and how they think of us. Here's what that means. If someone um, is to curse you in traffic, you don't think that much of it. But if someone like your spouse curses you, it becomes a label. L let me say it this way. The adhesive is stronger the more authority we give the voice. That it sticks more because we're closer and esteem them more. And so one of the first keys we have to recognize is this, if we're going to take labels off, is we've got to redistribute authority. Because if, if what people have said is what's sticking to us, and if it's what people who we esteem the most, then if we can change the authority, we can undo the adhesive. 
So, and that, and that, that's the reason 1 Peter 3, 14, look at this. It says, but do not be terrified. Maybe your version says intimidated. Don't be intimidated of them or be shaken, but set Christ apart as, not just Savior, as Lord. Here's what it means. Give him authority in your heart. To give him the authority. Reestablish his authority. And here's what it, it, it's, it's pointing to in this sense, is that for every one of us, a parent, a peer, someone we esteemed has said something to us that is stuck to us, and the only way it's going to come off is if we realize that only God has the authority to declare who we are. Look, look, I, want, I want to get into this a little more because I think, I think that sounds like something a preacher would say, but, but, but I want you to show you it's actually a legal matter. See, legally, there's only two ways you get to name something. It's either you created it or you purchase it. Like, like if you create it, one of the most um, kind of serious decisions I've ever had to make is what to name our kids. Uh, we named Sawyer. Um, it's a southern name because that's where he was born. Ellie means light because she, she just lit up our world. Um, Sydney means independent, which she is. Caroline means strong. We're already seeing it. Remington is the type of shotgun I'll use for those who try to date my daughters. Um, but, but, but listen, here's all I'm saying is I brought them into this world. I get to name them. Okay? Um, the other way is if you purchase it. And, and like if you have enough money, you can go downtown and buy a building. You put your name on it. If you, if you have enough money, you can buy a stadium. Put your name on it. If you have enough money, you can go to a marina, buy a boat, and you can put your name on it because you've bought the rights to name it. The only two ways. Did you know, spiritually speaking, legally, only God can name you? First of all, because he created you. The Bible says that he knit you together in your mother's wombs, which means he picked everything about you. He picked your personality. He picked your, 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 your flaws. He picked your, your, your the strengths. He picked your, your gifts. He picked your body type. He picked your outlook. And he put it all together like a work of art. He is the one who brought you in this world. He gets to name you. But the enemy wants you to think that illegally he can name you. So he uses other people's words and other people's insults to try to gain an illegal naming of you. But to that, God said, he doesn't just say, I created him. He says, okay, I'll purchase him. The Bible says you were bought with a price. What was the price? Well, God owns the earth and the fullness thereof, yet he did not write a check. God is wise and confounds all other wisdom, yet he did not offer consulting. God is more powerful, so powerful, he holds all the galaxies, yet he didn't barter away his power. Because his power and his wisdom and his ability do not measure his love for you. He said, the only thing that I'm willing to give that would show them what they're worth is the life of my son. Jesus is a reminder that God stands over your life with a birth certificate and a bill of sale and announces to every other label, I am legally the only one who can say who they are. Every other name is illegal because I hold authority. Now, listen, you know what that, that means? All we have to do is set our Christ as Lord of our heart. And when his authority is established, the adhesive of the label starts to come off. Here's the second one. Second one is you have to then replace the label. Now, one of the sad realities of having five kids is the language around our house can get pretty spicy. I mean, when they start to fight, I mean, you're going to hear some words, colorful words, poo-poo head, <laughs> tattletale. I, I know, their mother talks like that. That's, that's where they learned it from. <laughs> Notice she's not in this service. Um, you know what we do when one of our kids insults one of their siblings? We make them apologize, but then we don't just stop there. We also make them bless them. So they have to say what they love about them. You know why? Because an apology clears the air of the past, but a blessing empowers the relationship for the future. See, see, you don't need to just deal with old labels of the past. You've got to have something that empowers the future. David didn't just take something off. He put something on. And that's what you and I need because, listen, oh, this is worth, this is worth the price of admission today. Um, when it comes to settling your identity, receiving Christ is not enough. You must believe Christ and what he says about you. Let, let me say it this way. Receiving Christ secures eternity. Believing Christ secures identity. And many people are on their way to heaven looking like this because they received Christ, but they don't believe Christ and what he says over their life. 
Listen, I had someone DM me recently, and they, they were wrestling with their label, and they, they, they just said, it's so hard, it's so hard. I know this is not what God feels about me, but how to, and this was the crux of their question, how do I get what God says to supersede how I feel? Oh, what a question. How do you get what God says to supersede how you feel? Well, I wrote out a response, and when I looked at it, I was like, man, that's a good sermon. So I'm just going to give it to you, okay? Here's the first one. This is your how-to. Um, you first write out the wrong label. I mean, start with a piece of paper and write the label that you feel like you're dealing with. Now, now, now listen, there's a group of people in the Christian world who, who kind of hold this idea that we shouldn't acknowledge bad things. Like, like, well, let's just act like that doesn't exist. Let's like, like, like that, well, that, that's not a thing. You know, that doesn't exist in my life. And, and what I, I know that's popular in certain circles, but it's not biblical. Okay, Deni the Bible doesn't teach denial. It doesn't. As, as a matter of fact, um, that is the difference in positive thinking and scriptural thinking. Positive thinking says, let's act like it doesn't exist. Scriptural thinking says, oh, it exists, and grace supersedes it in my life. It is, it, that's the way the Bible says if you struggle with sin, you don't deny that the sin is there. You confess it because it's acknowledging I'm not in alignment with God and I need his alignment to come into my life. So listen, we start with naming what it is. Otherwise, how do you, how do you find a solution for a problem you refuse to name? But then right beside it, here, here's the solution. Write out God's reality. D did you know you don't have to guess how God feels about you? I think this is, this is the most misnomer. God wrote 66 volumes of books of how he feels about you. It's the scriptures. And one of the most powerful things you or I could ever do is on that piece of paper, we could put God says I am and put a blank. God says I am, blank. And then just go through scripture and feel, feel what you find God says you are. And here's what you're going to find. You have now created something where on one side, is, it, it's, it's there, it's a label. But on the other side, you have to see it in view of what God says. So you know what that's going to look like? It's going to look like this. I don't like myself very much but I am loved by God. I, I, I don't have much confidence in this season, but I am more than a conqueror through him who gives me strength. It's, it's, it's gonna, it's, I, I, I failed in mistakes and struggle, but I am free and forgiven. And then you're going to have to see on a piece of paper that what you feel about yourself doesn't weigh to what the God of the universe has said. Now, I don't, I don't want to act like this is easy. Because it's not. You're going to have to repeat it a lot. You can't just do this one time and it works. It's not a magic wand. It's a, it's a process. So here's what that's going to require is just acknowledging this stuff's sticky. Like it's been there for years. Long time this has been here. And so you're, you may have to take seven days just on one of these. 21 days. Uh, six months just on one of them. Just one of them. You know, I'm not rejected. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am not rejected. I am the righteousness of Christ. I am not rejected. I am the righteousness of Christ. And, and you do that until, until one day you basically can look and say, nope, I'm accepted because I've replaced it. And then you know what? You go to the next one. You say, I'm not doomed. God's got a plan for my life. And, and it's a hope and a future. I'm not doomed. And you're going to have to pull and pull and pull. And then one day you're going to pull it off. And there's going to be, nope, there's a destiny. There's a plan. And then you're going to work to the next one. I don't lack. I don't lack because he's, God's given me his sufficiency. Everything I need is found in him. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And you're going to have to seven days, 10 days, 21 days. But eventually you're going to see grace covers whatever you lack. Now I want to stop here though. Because as I was praying, this is what I think many of you look like. You've settled. That, that, that some of you that are more mature in the faith, here's what happens. You started working down the list, but at some point you settled to, to, to just keeping some of the labels. But I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit's not settled. Jesus' complete work on the cross did not take place so you could live with partial freedom. His whole work was so you could be whole. And so you know what, he's, he, he's pressing you today, pressing you today. It's time to get back to work, time to work the word, 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 until, until, until I come to a place where I am forgiven and my failures don't matter anymore. Now, you know why you, you do this? Not just because I say it, because here's what I was thinking about. You have to spend more time with you than anybody. Like, you have to listen to you more than anybody else has to listen to you. The rest of us can turn you off. You can't turn you off. Why would you want to listen to yourself with wrong thinking when you could be right? Listen, you got to do the work. But, but, but this is what I want to finish with, because I think this is, this is what it took me years to understand. Um, then you have to embrace this new label. 
Consider this. David walks on the battlefield a shepherd, walks off a war hero. Walks on, this, walks on a little boy, walks off a general. Like, you, you can read it. I mean, it's that quick his life changes. That seems like what we want, but, but, but consider this, how hard that would be to live out. I, I mean, think about that. He spent a lot more years in a shepherd's field than in a palace. He spent a lot more years as a little boy than he has a general. He's used to people disregarding him. He's war rejection a whole lot longer than he's war authority. And so the real battle was not Goliath. The real battle is, can he get up every day and believe what he is now wearing? And, 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 and that's the battle you're in. Oh, it's easy in a worship service. Listen, today it's easy to believe you're these things. I got this mannequin out. I'm preaching. You're going to go out and have a corn dog. It's easy today to believe you're accepted, destiny, great. This is easy. The question is, The question is this, can you believe this on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday? Because you're going to get up and look in the mirror and your hair's going to be everywhere and your breast smells bad and you're not, you do not look like more than a conqueror. And that's where our insecurities start to override our new identity. And it's how people who have once took off a label start putting it back on. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to look in the mirror and you're going to go... I don't have the strength to keep this up, this new identity. I don't have the understanding. I don't know enough. I, I'm not strong enough. I'm not passionate enough to keep I'm not enough to keep up this new identity. So I've got a little secret I'm going to let you in on. Listen, lean in. You're right. You don't have what it takes. Some of you are like, wow, I didn't see it going that direction. I thought this was like positive. <laughs> you don't have what it takes. And that's okay. Listen, because God's plan for you doesn't have to be sustained by you. Look, look, look at this. 2 Corinthians 3, 4. Man, this verse is blessing me. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves or claim anything coming from us, but... Our sufficiency is from God. Here's what he's saying. I looked in the mirror and realized I don't have what it takes to keep this plan going. Did you, did you realize that the things that you're very aware of and you like the defects, they are very apparent to God as well. And yet he still called you. The things that you think disqualify you, he's very aware of them. That, that, and, and he's chosen you instead, in spite of them. That, that for us, we think, well, I don't have enough strength and enough passion and enough wisdom. But God's plan for your life is not banking on you. It's banking on his spirit in you. See, see God's not going to put a bet on you. He's betting on himself. He's saying that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is enough to get you into this new identity. And he's saying when your strength fails, it's your sufficiency. When, 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 your, when your passion wanes, the spirit's your sufficiency. When, it, that when your wisdom has ended, his wisdom continues. That the sufficiency for this plan is not in you. It's in the spirit in you. Okay, so listen, listen, listen. That means all you got to do up is wake up, get up every day and put on grace. That's all you got to do, get up every day and put on grace. So when I was 19, it was a very pivotal year for me. I felt such a strong call to be a local church pastor. I, nobody in my family is in ministry, and so I went to my pastor to ask him, how can we do this? And here's what he said. He leaned back in his chair, his face was stern, and he looked at me and he said, nah, I don't think that's for you. He said, I think you should go into business or education. He said, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think that's for you. Now, before you kind of judge him, he, he's right. Because in that moment, and you're just looking, there ain't a lot there. I, I mean, I couldn't sing, so I'm not going to be a worship pastor. I don't like kids, so I ain't going to be a children's pastor. <laughs> Somebody said, you got a lot of kids to not like kids. I don't like kids. I like my wife. You know, that's how we end up with all these kids. So, so listen. <laughs> and, then, and then I'm introverted, and then there's not like, there's, there's not like this. Um, I, I'm, what you're seeing today is not there. 
And so he goes, nah, I don't think that's for you. And I just received it. And over the next year, friends of mine became pastors. Friends of mine who were on the same journey got opportunities. But I just saw no path for me. I just, I kept hearing my pastor, nah, that's not for you. So one day I was at the church that um, I attended in college and I was walking through the lobby and a, and a gentleman, an older gentleman named Boyd England stopped me. Boyd was an educator, a counselor. He'd been a pastor, but he was retired. He's an elder in our church. He stopped me and we're talking. And before I turned, he, he said, hey, I, I want to tell you, Joe. He said, I see a pastor on the inside of you. And without even, without even hesitating, I went, no, no, brother, no, that, that's not. And he stopped me, put, put his hands around me, towered over me, and he said, you listen to me. I know what I see when I see it. And he said, I see a pastor, and you got, whether you see it or not, I see it. You're going to be a pastor one day. I spent the rest of that week thinking, could that be? Could, is, is it possible? That, and whatever had turned off on me that year earlier suddenly got turned back on. And, and, and um, so, so Saturday night, and I'm trying to think, well, if I'm going to receive this, something's got to, I, I mean, I'm going to be a pastor. I need, I need to be like a pastor. Well, I didn't have any place to preach or anything to do, so you know the only thing I could come up with? <laughs> I decided I was just going to start wearing a suit to church. <laughs> Pastors wear suits, I'm going to wear a suit. I remember the first Sunday I show up in a suit, all my friends look at me like, you got a wedding to go to after this? And you know what? I wore a suit. And the next Sunday, I wore a suit. And the following weeks, I wore a suit. And, and listen, I didn't have nowhere to preach, but I wore a suit. And I didn't give, wasn't given a title, and I, but I wore a suit. And it's just interesting because about three years later, that's the local church that hired me to come on as a pastor. That eventually, what I wore became what I actually wore in my calling. Now, now listen, listen. You don't have to wear a suit to be a pastor, obviously. Um, <laughs> But God knew I needed a new mindset, so he gave me a new outfit. Oh, some of you, you think you're an inadequate mother, but God says you're not an inadequate mother. I knit and formed you. You're the perfect mother for these kids, and if you'll just put that on every day, they're going to grow in favor with God and favor with man. Some of you think you don't have what it takes. You're not smart enough for this semester, but God says you have the mind of Christ. His wisdom resides in you. You just put that on every day and watch and see if you don't end up on the honor roll at the end of this semester. Some of you think, I'm not husband material because of where I've come from. Yes, you are because Jesus lives on the inside of you and he's a perfect husband to his bride the church and if you just put that on every day you're going to shift the atmosphere of your home some of you are here and you say I, I couldn't do this Christian thing I, I just wouldn't be able to live that out yes you can because his mercies are new every morning and you're he's a new you're a new creation in Christ you the old has passed away and there's a new you and if you'll just put that on you're going to have a strong faith and sure steps if you'll just wear it he'll work it out. If you'll just wear it, he'll work it out. If you'll just wear it, you're going to look in you know, a few months, a few years, and you'll say, I look like a totally different person, not because of what you have done, but because of who lives in you and your ability to just live with that reality every day. Come on, you, God's got a new label for you, a new label for you. I want to pray for you. Will you stand to your feet? Would you bow your heads? I just want, I want you to, I want you to think on you. What's God saying to you? Not to the person beside you, not, not what, what's coming in a little bit. What, what, what is God thinking about you? What's he saying to you? So if you're here and you would say this, Pastor Joe, I need, I need a new label. Well, it's only two things required. The first one is you have to admit that you're wearing the wrong labels. Like, you just got to admit this, yeah, that's me. I'm, I've got some stuff that's, that, that's been guiding me. I've got some things I believe that I'm, I'm yeah, I, that's me. I've got the wrong labels. And then here's the second thing. You have to be brave enough to, to admit you're not following Christ. Because the label doesn't go until his authority is reestablished. And you say, well, how do I know that? Well, are you in a relationship with Jesus? Like, are you sure you're in a relationship with him? You say, well, I attend church every once in a while. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, do you know the living God? You're sure of your relationship. If you say, I'm not right with God, if you're brave enough to go, you know what? I've got labels and I'm not right with God. 
then all you've got to do is make a decision to follow Jesus. You give him the authority and his declarations come over your life. And not just for today, from here on out. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Hope that you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more messages and other content here at Twin Rivers Church, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time that we upload something new to our YouTube channel. Now, while you're here, go look at past messages and other content, and we'll see you next time.